I'm not exactly sure how to say it, but shall I try Gramite? And uh, thanks for the opportunity to give a bit of a technical uh, discussion tonight. I hope everybody online is uh, having a good audio. And I think if you can just write a message, Anthony will pick that up. So uh, welcome everybody here. Thanks for attending and thanks for the GFI organizing this and the opportunity to give a bit of a technical understanding. And I think we all learn always from sharing our technical knowledge. Um, I'm Ace Jonker and I'm from South Africa, currently uh, in uh, Australia, um, in this beautiful airport. It's called Lumpy's Place, or what is it actually? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a beautiful place here and brilliant facilities. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity. So for tonight, we're going to discuss a bit about wing design and what the speeds are meaning for the design engineer and also what does it mean for the pilot and why we must take care as a pilot to stay within what the design engineer intended. So obviously our goal with the wing design is to achieve high performance. Uh, we would like to have a good handling. Um, obviously we need to meet structural requirements specified by the authorities and the requirements are set up not to make life difficult, but it is to make aircraft safe. And if you can just appreciate that all specification requirements are written in blood. So we learn from experience and we rectify that and we improve and for future designs, um, certification requirements helps the designers to design within an envelope where aircraft is safe and become safer. And, and then last, so we would like to make a manufacturer product and a sellable product. So it's pointless we design meeting all these requirements and nobody would like to have our design then it's uh, actually quite a disaster. So the process that we're designing it um, is a bit of an iterative process. We we very seldom reach to a design the first time around. So obviously we start with the aerodynamic design um, to create high performance. And that's defined in geometry. The geometry, not geometry um, adds to the performance, but it also heavily contributes towards handling. After that, flight loads is, we look at the structural requirements and the flight loads are determined. And um, for every single load case, we have to check that the aircraft meets the minimum requirements um, as specified by the certification requirements. And then obviously we have to look at uh, the achievable geometry, what we can now achieve and do with the geometry that we have achieved the stiffnesses for the different requirements. Will we meet the structure requirements? Will we meet the flutter requirements? Will we meet the handling requirements? And will we, with this geometry, meet our intended performance? And then if there are any changes, for example, this chief design engineer might say, I don't get the wing stiff enough. And then you look back, can we increase materials? We go back to the structure requirements. Can we increase the materials? No. Go back to the, to the aerodynamic engineer and say, can you make the wing thicker? And then obviously you say no. But after a while, he has to make it thicker and he does a complete real aerodynamic design with a thicker profile to meet the structural guy stiffness requirements. And this process can, can continue a few steps. For example, the JS5 wing was full five iterations of complete aerodynamic design and simulation back to the system. See that the flex is too much. We will lose performance in twist back to the aerodynamic, back to structures and the circle five times completed. And then we say, okay, now it meets all our requirements but the wing did not look like our initial design. But the initial design probably looked a little bit better for us, but it will not be as good as the final design. All right, so it's quite a, a, a complex iteration. So based on this, I will start immediately and initially just to, to stuff that you are familiar with. The final product, after it's certified, you get into your hands and you actually get something on the panel. Very, very bright and colorful. And why is it so colorful? Just because we like colors. No, there's a lot of information hidden on the airspeed indicator, which we can quickly share tonight. And as you can have a look there, um, a lot of colors is white, there's green, there's yellow, there's white, there's red. And all of them has a specific indication based on your design, your specifications, and in the end, what you achieved. And all of this, is captured on one single instrument without you having to remember what's written in the flight manual. Okay, let's first look what 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 the instrument is saying. I can't point on the screen, but if you look there, 
if you look at the bottom of the arc, nothing happens until about 98 kilometers an hour. Or if you look in the bottom scale, about 54 knots, 53 knots. And there the white arc starts. Now the white, white arc is the acceptable range for flaps. So the bottom of the arc is the stall speed, maximum all up weight with full flap. So I think how many of you guys knew that? That this is actually your stall speed full of flap. And we're not so many of our guys knowing that. The next end is what where's the end of the white arc? The end of the white arc is the maximum speed allowed for either full flap or in this case for what flaps were given in that specification. So you see the bottom arc ends here with flap four and five, around about 90 knots, or in kilometers an hour, about 160. So at landing flap, the maximum speed with landing flap is 160 kilometers an hour. You can almost think about it. It's your red line speed with full flap. So the end of the white is actually a red with, uh, with a certain flap condition, which makes that an important factor that you have to consider when flying with full flaps. Where flaps are changeable also for end route, like in gliders, you will see these little white dots, and you can see that the flap uh, three is at uh, 220 kilometers an hour. That's the red line for flap three, and then flap one and two is the same as the actual red line of the aircraft. Quite interesting, a lot of information on the white line. Let's look at the yellow line. Let's first do the green line. The green line starts a little bit further than the white line, and I think you, you can guess that this is with flaps in the end route position. So that is not positive flap, so that is the end route or neutral flap position. And you see the stall speed at the neutral flap position is about five knots faster. Um, and that starts at about 192 kilometers an hour. So that's a stall speed, maximum weight with neutral flap. And the, uh, the white arc, um, sorry, the green arc then continues to 200 kilometers an hour where the yellow arc starts. So what is the green arc? The green arc's end of the green arc means the maximum speed allowed where the pilot can apply full deflection of the controls. All right, so if you apply full deflection of the controls up to that speed, it means that the structure, the structure will maintain the maximum load that you can apply. All right, after the yellow line, if you apply full deflection, the aircraft is outside of its design specifications and you will exceed the maximum load factor without safety factor. There's always a safety factor built in, but now the aircraft will be exceeding its maximum design load. And in all aspects, exceeding this speed means that the aircraft is no longer airworthy because the structure limitations has been exceeded and it might undergo certain inspections. And the manufacturer might have to have some word on it if this aircraft is still airworthy. All right. The yellow line, as we said, starts at the bottom and ends at the top at, at the red line. The bottom is actually selected by the manufacturers for two instances. One's for full control deflection. That is what you call the VA. But as well, coincidentally, or not coincidentally, selected by the manufacturer, also the rough airspeed. Means if you have a certain gust flying with controls neutralized at that speed, the maximum theoretical gust will be withstand on the bottom of the yellow line. But inside the bottom of the yellow line, it means if you fly that speed and you hit the theoretical maximum gas load, but it's theoretical, it could be much stronger in real life, but it's statistically what one could expect in a statistically in a flight, then the gas load may exceed the aircraft's limitations, even you holding the control stall. And obviously then we get to red line. Now red line, all over that, the closer you get to red line, the bigger gust at that speed and the bigger the, the input of the pilot is, the worse the effect is. But from the red line onwards, that has got to do with other factors again related to the maximum design speed again. So that's something completely else. So the red line stops with the, when the manufacturer or the designer said, that's the maximum speed. And we're going to come now to how does the manufacturer select the maximum design speed? All right. So the red line is a 
factory that tells the pilot, oh, please don't go further than this, because further than this, you also become a test pilot like us. We test it a bit further, but um, maybe you should stop at the red line. And only stop at the red line when it's calm air. Just don't go and do that in rough conditions, and please just don't deflect the stick too much. So this is what that red line is telling you as a pilot. All right, makes all sense. A lot of information on one piece of instrument. The last piece of instrument on it is not so critical. It's the blue line. And the blue line is where we do flight testing maximum all up work with maximum continuous power. What is the best rate of climb? And you see for an aircraft, it's quite low. For a propeller driven aircraft, it's quite, quite low. Um, for a jet aircraft, it's much, much faster. But this depends on how the engine with the airframe perform at a certain condition. And then the very last one is the yellow triangle which is the approach speed at maximum load. So this is the typical approach speed at maximum load, and it's only around about 1.1 stall speed. So it's just a touch over stall speed at maximum all up weight. So it's quite a low speed. So um, provided, given the, the red yellow line, if I would land full of water, this is the absolute minimum approach speed that I will use. I will not go below the yellow line speed at maximum all up. But obviously, if your aircraft is lighter, if you dump your water, and you're far away from maximum all-up weight, the speed, the approach speed could be safely flown below the yellow triangle. Oh, that's on the airspeed. I think you guys have maybe not learned something, but if you haven't known this, um, it's quite interesting information. The handbook about all the speed restrictions on one dial. Good. So now let's look from a designer's point of view, and then we can have a look at the certain few aspects. And I made a line there that's, that, that, that represents the speed line. Why do I have it in a line? Because to the left is slow, to the, to the, the right is fast. And we're going to define what these elements on the line means. So the first one is that S1. Now S1, VS, means stall speed. Um, VS0 is one specific airspeed in a specific configuration. Maximum all-up weight. Landing gear extended. Flaps down. That is your VS0, and it's always one speed, where VS1 is a stall speed for a specific configuration. What configuration? I don't know, whatever we define. The VS1 could be with flaps, it could be without flaps, it could be um, maximum all-up weight, it could be empty weight. So VS1s, there's hundreds of VS1s that we define for flight testing, which we need to use. So it is, it's undefined speed. You have to look at what the configuration is, and there's a VS1 for that. The next one on that line is V-Climb. So this is the speed which is not defined in the certification requirements, but it's what we design the aircraft to climb well for. So it's at this speed range, we would like the aircraft to perform nicely. Then the next one on the line is VA. That is your maneuverable speed. So let's look at the line there. So VS1 is an estimate um, design stalling speed in this case, it's set now with wings neutral and air brakes retracted because this is the configuration that we would like to show in this specific example. The V climb is just a climbing speed and VA is the design maneuvering speed, the highest speed where you can apply full control deflection. All right. VB again is the speed at which the aircraft can capable of withstanding vertical up or down gusts of up to 15 meters per second. So it's quite a serious gust. And um, when we design it, um, the gust is quite a, a, a steep ramp up. So it's a, it's a massive acceleration on the airframe. And this is why VB is for the design engineer, the most critical speed to consider. And we'll check now on the envelope when we get there. So if you can see in the requirement there, one can select VA but it may not be higher than VB. So VB you design and VA you can select. All right, but when you select VA, we make the yellow line whatever you've selected. So we can determine that VB, the cast load speed, is for example, 100 knots or 120 knots, and we can select VA, the yellow line, to start also at 120 knots, or we can select it a little bit lower. So conservatively, we can select it lower if you wish to, but you may not select it higher. And then VNE, that's the red one we, we talked about. This is the speed that the aircraft should still be safe to fly with, 
at still, still conditions, no turbulence, with a pilot not applying maximum deflections, with other words, quite significantly reduced ref the, the deflections. And at this speed, you know that the testing was done at a significantly higher speed. So this is safety margins. If you fly VIN E at, at the calm conditions, this is safety margin. All right. And then the next one is the VDF, and you can see VDF is the somewhere above VNE. This is the demonstrated dive speed, um, and this is the maximum speed that you've demonstrated it, where the test pilot had the guts to fly to. All right, and this speed may be the same as VD, the maximum design speed, or it can be slightly less. It can be up to 10% less than the maximum divide, uh, maximum design speed. So those are our speeds. So now, now we have to see how we calculate all of these speeds. It's quite an interesting matter. So therefore, have you ever heard about the flight envelope? So the, the test pilots talk about it's like an envelope, like you open it. But actually what, what, what you see is it consists out of various speeds so on the on the horizontal axis we have speed on the vertical axis we have the loading with other words how much g's at a certain speed all right so if we look at uh, a v speed from a flight envelope obviously if the speed is zero um there's absolutely no load you if the aircraft you can climb now and lump this beautiful glider out there you can pull the stick all the way back the loading on the wings would be zero all right but as you advance forward in speed, as soon as we start to advance the speed, we could actually see that slowly they will be able to start to load the wings. Even if we just start moving, we can already start loading the wings. As the speed is building up, we can load the wings, but we cannot load it more than that. Why not? The wings are stores. You know, there's absolutely nothing. There's absolutely not enough speed to create a high load. So as you can you can all imagine if you fly just above stall speed, you can whack the stick back and the rider just go, mm, there's almost no G's because it's not enough speed to create the lift. But this speed goes rapidly up to a maximum point up there, which the specif the, the, the specification requirements force you. And this is, we will see what that point is now. Then it comes down and this speed is now your VDF, your design speed. And they say, okay, you don't have to, you only design to that point, so that's your envelope. The same story when you fly negative. If you fly and you push the stick forward, you have a negative G to a certain point, and then this point reduces also to your VD, um, and we'll explain now why the envelope looks like that. So can you see it looks like an envelope? A little square thing almost looks like it. It looks funny. If you, if you open the envelope, it's not a complete square. It looks a bit funny, and this is where the name comes from. It almost looks like an envelope. All right. So every design aircraft has its own VD speeds and its own envelope. So it's a characteristic on how you design your aircraft. Good. And one thing that is critical is the mass of the non-lifting wing. I don't have a nice thing to, to, to demonstrate it, but maybe if we, if we look at this. So this was the wing, and the wing is carrying, and there's a lot of weight on the inside. You can see there's a huge bending moment. On this wing. So the more weight you put in, if I support it and I, this is the wings and I add load here, the this structure will bend. And it will bend and bend and bend until something breaks. So if you have the stuff in the middle is the non-lifting weight, and non-lifting weight is anything that is not main wing. So everything not main wing. So fuselage, tailplane. In fact, the tailplane even pushes down. So the tailplane increases the mass of the non-lifting weight in your design calculations because the tailplane helps to push down. It doesn't lift, it pushes down. Right, so pilot, fuel in the fuselage, engine in the fuselage, passengers, food, battery, oxygen, all of this increases the non-lifting weight and therefore the design engineer selects the maximum non-lifting weight, which you can carry on board and then you store within this envelope. So, good, almost crashed. So let's look at the envelope. So if you look at the CS requirements, now that paragraph there, C is 22337. 22 means it's for sailplanes and power sailplanes. 337 is the limit maneuvering load factors. And that paragraph will be consistent with 
22 aircraft, with 23 aircraft, with transport aircraft 25, all of them will have virtually a similar paragraph for that with their own load factors associated with it. All right, so everybody's got something and they say, in certain conditions, your load factor must be 5.3, in other conditions 4, then minus 1, minus 2.65. And we're now going to see where the design engineer must apply these load factors to make it work. So the first formula that you have to comply with is the one on top there is that the maneuvering speed VAE must be the stall speed multiply the square root of V1, so square root of 3.5. And if you see that is 3.5, there's somewhere and that's the square root of it. That is the first line and the speed here would be VA. So VA is defined, that specific VA is defined that position is defined as a factor of the load factor. So you see, the more the specifications require to do it, the further the speed moves up. The square root has got something to do, to do with the fact that lift is a factor of the, 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 the square of the speed. All right, so that is the, why this is a square root associated with it. The second um, factor that we, that we have to consider now is that is the A position, the A point. And that is your VA speed that is defined. So wherever that VA speed is, um, is, is, is over there, that is the load factor that you have to comply with. So that load factor there is that is load one, two, three. You see that will be 5.3 up there. And the speed is defined here. That is given by the certification requirements. And the design engineer has to fulfill that requirement. No choice about it. The first point is given by the guys. You select the stall speed, what you want to have, we tell you where the point must be. So stall speed I, VAI. All right. So therefore, a K8 or a very light aircraft has a much lower one because it's somewhere here. I mean, if you have an aircraft with a high stall speed, you have to have a high VA. So on this side, as I explained before, it's your positive stall. So you cannot get past this line because even if you push full back, you cannot generate more Gs, it's easy to take it in the in a in a in a zero position. If you pull full stick back, you cannot go more than zero. As the speed goes up, you always will stall on that line. Always will stall on that line to that point over there. At least you get to a point where we now say, okay, you don't have to pull full stick back and stall the aircraft. Now there's a different line. And the next line is defined. Let's first look at the negative side. Sorry, let's go negative first. The same in any flight, you can push the stick out forward, and the requirement says uh, it must be minus 2.65. So at the negative stall, minus 2.65, this is where you have to be um, designed towards. Not that anybody of a glider pilot pushes stick forward, but especially you have to be able to do that load. If the guy pushes full forward, that you don't break the wings in the negative configuration. Good. Now let's look at the next one, and that is now where the envelope stops on the right hand side. So we have first the, the lowest point, let's look at the highest point. The maximum design speed is defined by a formula. And there are two formulas, one for the normal category or the utility category, and one for subplanes of aerobatic category. All right, so this is the formula, this next formula that we would like to comply with. And it's 18 times the third square root what is W over S? Who can tell me what that is? Yeah, like. wing loading. Weight divided by area is wing loading. So can you see the higher the wing loading is, the higher your VD is. Makes sense. And then divide by CD min. Who knows what CD min is? What is CD? No, it's not that thing with the music on. What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not a CD. CD min is the coefficient of drag, correct, correctly said. It's a coefficient of drag. And for a south plane, this is typically around 0 0.01, if I remember it correctly. And with other words, the cleaner your aircraft is with the least, with less drag, the cleaner and cleaner it becomes. The smaller this number is and the higher that number has become. Because you divide by a small number, your VD is increased. All right, so VD is not guessed. If you make your aircraft with a very high wing loading, you pay for that with a wing loading formula. 
And if you have high wing loading, you have a very small structure, I see some small structures out there, the CD min is in the low number, which is pushing up that VD to a massive number. And this is the VD that you have to define. Okay. Now, if you remember that first table at VD, you still have to maintain four Gs, huh? a, a factor of N4. And therefore, the envelope goes down at VD, which is defined by this formula, to four Gs. And the negative side, we have exactly the same story. On the negative side, we have N3, when the N3 was a little bit lower, only minus 1.5, and there's our envelope completed. Does it make sense? So the critical, critical design points of the designer is that line, that line, especially up there for cell And we have to consider that line. For us, cell designers, the most critical point is point A. And in actual fact, this line VB is very much influenced about the flutter speed. So although they say what the minimum is, we have to be flutter free until 1.2 VD. So that's high speed. Okay, let's see if we can get a bit of further information. When you have a flapped aircraft, we have to consider three cases, positive flap, negative flap, and end route flap or neutral flap. Neutral flap has got a specific, spe uh, specific definition. We cannot just say, ah, my flap three is neutral. There's a specific angle flap setting defined by the CS22 specification where they tell you what is neutral flap. All right, so in neutral flap, that is typically the neutral flap uh, positive store line, but then we have, a, uh, uh, let me just explain this. Then we have a positive store line and the negative store line as well. So you can see that the, with positive flap, you can actually create a little bit more load than you will get with zero flap. So that line actually goes a bit further up. So you don't only consider the neutral flap line, you have to consider your maximum positive flap line for the maximum speed that you designed for. So you don't have to go all the way to VA if your flap speed is lower than VA. Then if you, for example, landing flap only needs to go to the maximum of the end of the white line, where the rest of further flap setting. So it might some, sometimes a little bit of a step because US designer can select your flap speeds to a certain extent, and therefore you're allowed to select how the steps are stepping up. However, our experience is that that one position point up there at A is still your critical design point. So if you meet that point, all the other points are met. And this is why VB is for the design engineer, the most critical number to consider in his load calculations. It normally, although you consider all cases, normally that one always comes out. Interestingly, for different manufacturers, it could be different. I just explained for, for the products that we have. Um, if you look now here at uh, v, uh, flaps and VDF on the right hand side, it also has to be considered that the flap speed is also considered in the maximum design speed. But remember, you can actually chop it off. So we only have to consider flap one and flap two. But because flap two has got a higher lift coefficient, so the critical case on that side will be with the maximum flap setting, which is that VF is flap two. We don't have to consider landing flap there because it will long time be broken off if you fly at VNE with landing flap, if you can maintain that speed or you can have that speed. So let's just check quickly how do we determine the speeds. First, the stall speed is very much dependent on a function of the wing area and the profile. The VA is the highest speed at which we get full control deflection, and we say this, the, the stall speed multiplied by the factor. VB is the gas speed, and VNE obviously is, is, is VNE must not be smaller or bigger than 0.9 of the design speed. What, what does it mean? That 0.9 means that you have to test the aircraft at least 10% more than what you give to the customer. So if your red line on your aircraft, let's select a number that's easy to calculate. So your number is 300 kilometers an hour VNE, means that we have to test to 330 kilometers an hour minimum. All right. Um, and then obviously we explain here yeah, the maximum design speed. And it can be chose, chosen, but there in the end, 
gusts of 7.5 meters per second must still be obtained. So there's another factor coming in, and that is now the gust factor. So let's look quickly at the gust flutter speeds. And then, as I said, analytically, you have to prove that your aircraft is flutter free to 1.2 VD. So can you see how safe the aircraft must be? You can fly it quite fast before it should break up in flight, but such big margins are selected by the authorities because a flutter case is normally so destructive, it's a, it's, it, it could be fatal. And therefore they keep the pilots quite far away from it and force the engineers to push it quite far up. All right, so let's look at the gas envelope. So for the gas envelope, a positive gust of 50 meters per second, and obviously we start at 1G, but the line of 50 meters per second must be maintained. And at the VD, 7.5 meters per second. So now we can see that the gust envelope is uh, designed for VB at 15 meters per second, and at VA, Let's just give that an idea. And at, and, and, and at VD, 7.5 meters per second. So you have from the 1G scenario, you have a 50 meter per second gust. And from the 1G scenario, you have minus 50 meters per second. And at VB, that is our point, is for the gusts. What does it mean? If you hit a 15 meter gust and you fly on the end of the yellow line, that the structure is strong enough to maintain that. Now we select VA and VB the same, which means that if we fly at VB equals VA at that end of the yellow line speed and we give full control deflection, the wings will not break. However, if you give full control deflection at VA and you have a little bit of gust, you might break the, break the wing. So the two are not adding up, they're independent. So we either the gust or the pilot. What does it mean? You as pilot, when you fly extremely fast, don't fiddle around, don't add up to that gust that you go through. All right, so you can actually in the early stage of the yellow line, with the gust and lots of deflection already exceed the maximum design loads. So you're not completely safe in the yellow line speed. You are fairly safe if you hit not the gust more than 50 meters per second, and you keep the, the stick fairly still. Exceeding the yellow line, or flying in the yellow line, means now that if you have that gust load, you can already exceed it. If you hit the stick, you already exceed it. And a small combination of the two, you could also exceed it. So you can see as you fly in the yellow, why is it yellow? Because the risk now is already higher because two factors, the pilot and the gas, if they work in parallel together, could end up with the pilot testing out his parachute. All right, I hope not. Okay, guys, so uh, makes sense. So the 7.5 meter per second, and there you see the gust envelope. So we have two envelopes, maneuvering envelope, VA, and the gust envelope, VB. All right, it is a little bit technical, but um, it gives a good explanation of, 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 of how, it, how it's done. And obviously, if you add the flaps, add it to a positive flap and negative flap, you have to consider the speeds a little bit higher. But it's quite interesting. So you can see we have a lot of information that we have to consider. Then we also have in the pitching moments, you now you can see clearly VA there and the stall speed that you have there, it drops down to VD because why is this one lower? This number was selected lower because of the lower N number. Remember that N, the load factor at high speed was much lower than the 5Gs in one case, but the maneuvering um, gas load, um, the maneuvering gas load was, was lower, but also the gust was lower. It, that was 50 meter per second, that's 7 meter per second. So you can see the designer at least is allowed to design it a little bit weaker towards VD. Why? It tells the pilot, don't shake the stick around. We're going to give you another line, don't work that stick, please, because we don't design for it. So if it, everything was green to the end, it meant that the, that the pilot, the, the designer would have continued this line and would have designed to that design point if you didn't have a yellow line. Makes sense. Without the yellow line, I say again, that line would have continued and the critical design point would have been at VD. At least I realized then the glider would be so heavy it will not take off. So all of these things will move forward. So they chuck that away and said, just tell the pilot, give him a yellow line and brief them. Have briefings like this to educate them not to, to honor the yellow line. All right, I think we're progressing nicely here. So how did we, how, what, what happens um, in real life in flight? So you can see 
this is the non-lifting weight or the fuselage mass and tailplane mass and engine and pilot. And um, there's also a bit of weight. The, the purple is the, the, the green, the, the, the weight of the wing. <coughs> Sorry, the purple is the weight of the wing. And then the green is the lift, the typical lift. Now, this is not a perfect illustration because normally your wing area getting smaller and this tapers down. So this is not a complete good explanation of the of the of the lift profile, but it gives you some indication of what really happens. And you see here, if we add a little bit of weight there, then that bending moment on the wing is significantly reduced because if, as soon as you hit that gust, this part is actually pulling the wing down, relieving, really put a lot of relief on the bending moments. What's a bending moment? Oh, this thing bends up and creates a, a, a load on the spar. All right, so the long lifting wave, that's a massive influence because if this is bigger, then obviously the bending moment is more, as we have explained before. And um, if the non-lifting mass is increase, then the wing loading increase and we have to have higher design load. So that whole graph with non-lifting mass, the load factor is higher because it's the load factor as a result of the non-lifting mass. All right, so higher design loads, higher structural components, heavier structures, and, and the heavier you are, the heavy glider, weaker performance in weak conditions. So it's not desirable to have a heavy aircraft, higher stall speeds in the end, the glider could be so heavy that you cannot meet the minimum stall speeds again. So at one stage you limit it because your stall speed must be without water, must not exceed this number, and that's 80 kilometers an hour. So by making it too heavy, you add it. All right, so we can add mass to the wingtips to decrease the gas load. Um, and this is what we sometimes do. I think you see our race aircraft, we have a little bit of weight in it to compensate for the batteries in the fuselage. And this is a trick that you get away with. What do you do? You make the whole aircraft heavier, not smart. But it works. OK, so let's just look at this 24.2 meter wing of the, of the JS-5, which we call the king of the sky. The JS-5 Ray stands for, or Ray is a Spanish word for for um, for king, so we hope this will be the king of the sky. So we managed to test fly it just uh, about a week ago. I think it is just a little bit more than a week ago that we test fly it for the first time. And this was really five years of the iterative process between the design team and the structural team to get the performance and to ensure that this aircraft meets all those boxes inside that envelope. Right. So what did we do there? So we first calculated a. Okay, so we first um, calculated the VS1, which is about 85. This is all theoretical because when you start, you start theoretical, and then you can demonstrate it with flight testing. And um, hopefully, your calculations were good enough that your flight tests are valid. Put it See if you can get with this thing down. Okay, the VA for the JS. Obviously, the JS-5, we tried to get the speeds as low as possible, but we couldn't get it lower than 90, 196 kilometers an hour. That's the lowest according to that calculation that we've made. Um, therefore, we selected VB, the same number, the V and E, we selected as low as possible. Why? It's a big aircraft, so we don't really want to go and test fly this aircraft at, at more than 300 kilometers an hour. And we don't particularly, um, it's possible to do it flutter-free to 1.2, 300 kilometers an hour. So the, 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 the concern with this big aircraft is to make the 1.2 VD. And that's why we pull the, the speeds as low as possible, just to make the flutter speed. All the other speeds are easy in this case. Flutter is becoming the big problem. Therefore, we VDF is 301. We select VD as 301, or we design it for 301, and we selected VDF the same. And obviously, then we have to go and show it's flat to 361 kilometers an hour. So it is, in our opinion, quite low speeds, for such a big, for its low speed, but for such a big aircraft, it's quite acceptable speed. Because you don't really fly faster than 270 in this aircraft. You know, I think we, we probably aim to, to cruise not further than 220 in, in, in normal competition flight. But normally in final glide, then one forget about this yellow lines and become a test pilot. And we're brave because we do that 10 meters over the ground, maximum speed. There's a great group of competition pilots here. I, I see you. So the non-lifting mass um, is obviously um, all the engines are doing this. And if you look at the, the envelope of the of the JS2, JS5, I mean, 
you can see this line, that critical design point is where the, the, the blue line is the mass, the non-lifting mass. So you can see at high speeds, at high, at high masses, we can maintain a very high non-lifting mass because this line is the maximum load factor. You can see how the load factor goes up from 5 Gs up to about 8 Gs is the load factor as the mass is coming down. Why is that so? The lighter the aircraft is, if you apply that VB maximum, the higher the acceleration is. So the lighter the aircraft is, the easier it is to overstress it. Now, if you thought about that, we think always a heavy aircraft will break. You will break a light aircraft. And this is why the load factor increases with the decrease in mass. Very important. If you are light, you're on the higher risk. If you're heavy, the load factor comes down. And also, the, you can see the, the non-lifting mass when you are heavy is quite high. Until we get to this desired point of this mass here, we have to start to drop the non-lifting weight because of the load factor that comes down. So quite interesting, a non-lifting weight is not a constant. If you're heavy, you can be marked high. If it's lighter, you have to take care. So you can see this critical point here, if we fly our aircraft below 570, 580 kilograms around this area, below 580, we have to start to drop the non-lifting mass. And it's not all the manuals that gives that. Normally the manuals only gives that number because it's a, a nice number. Yeah, you have a, a 360, but it's actually a dropping value and significantly dropping at a certain point. Very important to remember. How many of you guys knew that? Not so many, huh? So non-lifting is a factor of the mass. Eric, we'll get to an answer just now. So let me just push through a little few things here. So this is what the JS5 typically will look exactly the same, exactly the same story as uh, you would have expect um, from the theoretical design. And you can see the different flap settings. Remember that this flap negative. You can see how the different flaps are pushing it higher. Um, that is the highest design point that VA, and then it drops slightly, and this is our envelope that we have designed it up in accordance with. So VA 196 for a big aircraft, not a low number like uh, selecting a, a, a low number like 180 or some, some aircraft you'll see out there that have quite low yellow line numbers. Um, we are forced by the specification to push a high number in. We design it according to that high number and we demonstrate compliance for that. Uh, and, and this is what makes aircraft designed according to a specification like the CS22 quite a safe aircraft, provided that we as pilot honor the envelope in terms of yellow line and also red line. So maybe we just, just have a few pictures on, on what we actually have. How does a wing look to be so stiff? You see first the bending moments. Can you see that massive spar for the bending moments? It's quite a massive job to accommodate that non-lifting weight, especially when it's light. And then in the second case, we have to do uh, analytical flutter analysis to ensure that we make the 1.2 VD. And you see, therefore, we do some analysis first on the ground. I can just go back where we define the different flutter modes and then physically ground vibration tests to shake the aircraft and to determine the natural frequencies. And then after we've determined the natural frequencies, we have a flutter, a, 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 an analytical flutter exercise. And then sometimes we don't believe the flutter companies and we say, all right, um, they say that we are fluttering between 1.2 VD and a little bit lower VD. And uh, we are not happy with the results. And they say, well, if you don't believe our results, why don't we go and test fly them? Um, and this is maybe not the, the smartest thing to do, but it's quite a brave thing to do. If you don't trust mathematics, you say, let's go and test it. So this is typically a graph where we have accelerometers on the wing. And we um, tried the bit, we, we tested our Flutter company, which is a real smart company. I think a lot of European companies also using them. So they did the ground vibration test, gave us the flutter test and say, this is the speed where you will get one mode of flutter. Remember, there's lots of modes. There's about 40 modes of flutter. You can get first, second mode or ah, it's this coupling with that. It's such a number of lists, but always you look at the critical one and the flutter was predicted. Now, if you can interpret, if there are some scientists amongst you to interpret this, this is acceleration and that blue thing there is speed. 
And if you see, there was a little bit of a hiccup in the center, right? which is probably where we introduced um, a bit of uh, excite something there to, to generate the flutter. So obviously you can see on the, on, the, on the start of the line there, the pilot had quite confidence pushing the speed up because he was aiming for that 1.2 VD, which is not so clever to do, but on the controlled conditions, one can slowly approach flutter. So um, we approach, we, we slowly increase the speed by 10 kilometers an hour, land, and then we evaluate the response of the input. See how quickly the damping is. And by extrapolating that, they can actually see how close you can get to flutter. So we just don't fly until you flutter, uh, flutter. We just can 10 kilometers, 10, 10. And every time the data builds up better and better history, at the time the flutter company knows exactly when it will flutter. So finally, I arrived to a speed around there and shaking stuff around, and it was still quite good. I landed and uh, the guys an analyzed it and he said, as we predicted, we are two kilometers away from flutter. And I said, come on, man, I was flying there. There's no flutter. I'm going to push another 10. And the guy was thinking with it. He was just looking like this. And he said, why don't we have going to have a, a, a nice lunch? And I said, oh, why? He said, because this will probably be your last lunch. I said, oh, my he, was quite, uh, he was quite adamant. He said, one kilometer an hour faster and then another one. So I accelerated to the speed here. You can see I was pushing it to that speed over there. Give the input, and immediately you could see how the acceleration start building up. And you can see that line there is quite an aggressive build up in seconds. You can see in two seconds time the G's increase from from about two G's to about seven G's in two seconds. So you can imagine in two seconds. And I did not increase the speed. In fact, what happened here? I was already decelerating. If you can see how the speed's dropping off. So there, braveness. And here, I wonder if I should continue with this. And this point, no, this is not going to work for me. So uh, maybe I would like to have another lunch. And you can see how this, uh, how quickly decelerating. And only at this point, you see how far you have to, you have, okay, it's over time. And uh, obviously, the, the Ephraim is inertia. So it continues fluttering. Although it probably at that point, at that point over there, it probably already um, turned from a, a, a positive, or where I say that negative damping into positive damping. So from there, it's positive damping. And then obviously we recovered from that situation. And I never saw an uh, engineer smiling so much and we were so unhappy and he was very happy. So it was a very conflicting emotions there. Um, why, I don't know, we were very, very unhappy and we couldn't believe that he was happy. Obviously, then we had to do um, design changes to, to make the wing more stiff. So we were the company we designed um, different um, layers and structures in it to make it stiffer in that one mode. And then we read it, the ground vibration test, and then we have it exceeded that. So what does it mean? You have to do this test and you must be prepared to make modifications to meet that requirement. Now, this video I'm not very proud about, but I thought maybe somebody would like to see it. So um, maybe I'm not sure if it is supposed, it's not for sensitive viewers, but you can see things are not looking so nice here. I have some I have some noise as well. So you see, if I start fluttering like that, I'm not really so happy. You can see how the nose is pitching up immediately to, to accommodate that. So if you just look at the wing, you can see what is the specific flutter mode that we that we experienced. You can see how steep the dive angle is. And can you see how the flutter is in, in the forward off motion? It, it doesn't look so bad in video. The accelerations in flight is amazing. You cannot believe if you if that wingtip saw eight G's forward and back, it's already a significant um, um, force on the on the product. So did you do a roll stick wrap to start it? Um, I think I think this was just aileron pass input that, that okay. initiated it. Yeah, so, so, so this was hitting the stick with a lot of confidence. So um, after this, we had a bit more respect for the analytical methods. But what's good about it, now we trust the analytical method. So if they tell us this is what's going to happen, we have a very good belief that this will happen and we can do um, design changes in the early process without going through a risky process of, of testing the word of the, of the, of, of the guys. So um, you can see it's a bit of a, of, a, of a story to design aircraft and it's a quite complex situation. And if you carefully consider all the calculations and you go through this process carefully, um, then you design an aircraft that we can offer, which is certified. What does it mean if it's certified? 
it complies to a set of certification requirements that's proven to provide safe aircraft. All right, guys, I hope it was interesting. So we've gone through this process a couple of times with the JS5, and then shortly we will be test flying it, starting with the test flight program, and then we'll push these envelopes and actually go and demonstrate in flight that it's also complying with the requirements I was designed. It. So I think I would thank you for that. I hope it was interesting. It's a little bit technical, but I hope you found it um, quite interesting. I could I have a, a few minutes for a, a few questions, um, but then unfortunately at about quarter past, uh, on the hour, quarter past nine, I have to do a presentation for the Swedish gliding organization. I'm just going to do it from here. So those of you are welcome also to this, but this is now going to be about all the products we're producing um, in our company. So if you're not in for another presentation, I have no problem if I didn't do it myself. It was not intended for, for the Australian audience, but uh, I'm glad if you sit here and you check. Um, obviously, I will be speaking with a with a with a Sweden audience about all the product development that we've done so far, and about the engines that we have taken the, uh, the vibration out, and the, the the different products that we've offered at this moment. So it's it's for the European audience quite an interesting talk. So thank you for that. Uh, that that I will think twice about. <laughs> okay, guys, thanks very much. So why is this the the role of the only mode test? Because that's the most sensitive. Yeah, the second. The role mode is that the main blind mode test because the one in English. Stop it! 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 Stop